Welcome to Coronavirus 101, a virtual event from uh, the Texas Tribune. In light of recent news um, and out of an abundance of caution, we at the Tribune have temporarily paused our in-person events. So we're sitting in our empty event space and, and uh, broadcasting virtually, if you will, to you at home, uh, looking for answers about COVID-19. I'm here with uh, Dr. Jason McClellan, an Associate Professor of Molecular Biosciences at the University of Texas at Austin and a leading expert on the coronavirus. We'll be taking your questions for Dr. McClellan throughout the conversation. We ask that you send them by either commenting below in this feed or tweeting us at hashtag AskTrib. Uh, I wanna thank our sponsors, Community Health Choice, Method Methodist Healthcare Ministries of South Texas, Texas Organization of Rural and Community Hospitals, and Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas. Though donors and corporate sponsors underwrite our events, they play no role in determining the content panelist or line of questioning. Uh, we wanna keep tabs on the latest coronavirus news in Texas. Subscribe to our evening newsletter for updates. That's at tribit, T-R-I-B dot I-T slash subscribe. Now, as I said, we'll be talking with Dr. McClellan until noon, and again, asking your questions throughout. As I mentioned, Dr. McClellan is a molecular biologist who obtained his PhD at Johns Hopkins University. He's worked for the National Institutes of Health and at Dartmouth University uh, before moving his lab to UT Austin, uh, where he works right now. So thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. It's a busy time me. for you. Lots of interviews. Uh, happy to try and get some information out there. Yeah, well, I mean, let's talk about those, the source of those interviews. You've led a team of researchers in creating a 3D atomic scale map of a critical part of COVID-19. What does that mean in layman's terms sure. and, yeah, for the broader, I guess, reaction to this uh, infection? Yeah, the, the coronavirus uh, virion, you can think of it as a spherical, and then protruding out from the surface are these spike proteins. The virus uses these to attach to our cells, so the spike binds receptors on the surface of our cells, and then after binding, it fuses the virus with the cell, causing the contents of the virus to enter our cell and now the cell is infected and it starts making more copies of the virus. Um, and so the spike is really the, the, the critical point that we want to try and, and prevent its function in order to prevent infection. Uh, and so what my lab was able to do was very rapidly uh, produce a stabilized form of the spike protein in our laboratory, uh, use cryo-electron microscopy to determine a, a three-dimensional structure of the molecule so we know where all the atoms and residues are in this molecule. And then that information can be used to design vaccines, to isolate antibodies, to design small molecule inhibitors. And we've been sharing the coordinates and reagents with groups all over the world. We've just been nonstop emailing coordinates and shipping proteins and plasmids to everybody. It's, yeah, it's been really hectic. Yeah, and then how, are, how much are you involved with those labs around the world working on a vaccine or some sort of treatment? Yeah, so our, our vaccine effort, so the, the antigen, the, the spike molecule we designed, uh, we think is, is a great antigen to be used in a vaccine. So if you inject a person with this stabilized spike, their body will recognize the spike as foreign, make antibodies against it. And then later, if they were to come in contact with the infectious virus, the antibodies will see that same spike protein, attack it, and hopefully prevent infection or prevent severe disease. So our collaborator, Dr. Barney Graham, at the Vaccine Research Center at the National Institutes of Health, he's moving forward the, the vaccine development efforts in collaboration with the company. This company has already shipped the first lots of the vaccine uh, to Dr. Graham, and they're beginning to enroll in the phase one clinical trial. So we're already beginning to test in humans. Um, and so it's really exciting and, and moving very fast. I got to tour your lab yesterday and you were talking about how in 2003 you were working on something that's just now in phase two. 2000, 2013. 13, we are now me. in something, yeah, it's seven years later that is only in phase two and you know it's, it's probably going to take five more years. And so to try and do phase one, phase two, phase three within 18, 24 months is incredibly fast. Um, it, based on all other historical vaccine development. And those different phases are, are basically testing levels? Yeah, they're different testing levels. Obviously, the main thing for, for a vaccine, for instance, is we have to make sure it's efficacious, that it's working how we want it to, and of course it has to be safe. We're injecting some foreign molecules into potentially millions, billions of people. So safety is a primary concern. Um, and so you have to start small. We first tested in a phase one trial in tens of people, 30, 40 people. Um, a few at a time, monitor them, make sure there's no adverse reactions. Uh, if, that looks, if that looks good, after the phase one's complete, then you go to a phase two, which is hundreds of people. 
Again, looking for safety, we can also start to look for some signs of efficacy. Are we, are we making the antibody titers that, that we're hoping to elicit? And then finally, you do a phase three, which is in the thousands of people, uh, where you maybe give one group of people the vaccine, the other group a placebo, and then follow them over the course of perhaps months and see did the vaccine prevent infections or prevent severe disease compared to the group that didn't receive it. Mm -hmm. um, and so all that is required. We can't just rush and start injecting things into people. Mm -hmm. um, I guess back up for a second. You've been studying coronaviruses for a number of years. Classify them or describe them in layman's terms because obviously people have become familiar with this term in recent weeks. Yeah, yeah. So we've known about them since the uh, 1960s. Got their name because these, these spike molecules uh, projecting out. Uh, when you look at an image of it, it kind of looks like a solar corona, like the sun and the flare is coming off. And so it was named coronaviruses. There are four of them that just circulate throughout the year. We've likely been infected with one or more of them throughout our lives, generally cause um, common cold. And then there are three that have emerged from, uh, a bat, from bats into humans and have caused epidemics and pandemics. The first was the, <clears throat> excuse me, the SARS coronavirus in 2002 and 2003. That infected around 8,500 people and killed around 850. So that had a 10% case fatality rate, 10% of the people with um, clinically proven uh, uh, infections uh, passed away, and then it disappeared. So there's been no uh, SARS infections since 2003, or after 2003. Mm -hmm. Then 10 years later, in 2012, 2013, there was the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus that emerged in the Middle East, also caused a severe respiratory disease. I think that's infected around 2,500 people, but about a third of those have, have died due to it. So. Uh, this one is transmitting much more easily human to human. So I think we're over globally 115,000 infections in, in climbing. Uh, the case fatality rate is somewhere in the, the 1%, 1 to 3%. It depends on population, region, function of age, and other factors. So much more infectious. It's killing fewer people uh, that are infected. But if it infects millions of people and kills 1%, that's extremely serious. Yeah. Um... Let me see. So you're answering some of the questions we're getting. As, oh. So I'm kind of scrolling down so we get to more. Um, we talk about, you know, different coronaviruses. A lot of people, and I don't know how fair a comparison it is to the flu, yep. but they talk about mutations. How does your work and those of other labs uh, account for that? Sure. Uh, the f flu mutates rapidly. It, there's a lot of diversity within, within flu. It's one of the reasons why every year we need a new flu vaccine to try and account for those mutations. The coronaviruses don't seem to mutate as readily and certainly not over um, this short of a time span at which we're developing a vaccine. So we're not really concerned that the vaccine molecules that we're testing now will be ineffective 18 or 24 months from now. Um, but there, we are starting to see some individual mutations arise in, in patients. Uh, none of them have appeared to lead to a more infectious or dangerous virus. A lot of the mutations tend to be attenuating, but it's something that's monitoring. People can now rapidly sequence the entire genome of viruses from people, and so we can actually track this and follow it over time. Mm -hmm. uh, in addition to vaccines, your lab is working on an antibody treatment. Talk about that. Yeah, so uh, vaccines, antibodies, and small molecules are three of the different methods to try and uh, intervene and, and blunt the spread of the virus. The, when you get infected or vaccinated, your body makes antibodies to, to recognize the, um, the virus in different parts of the virus. And so we can, if we get blood from people who have been infected and who have survived, then there's antibodies in the blood and in the cells that produce the antibodies. And then we work with collaborators. They can essentially take our stabilized spike molecule and kind of use it as bait, like on a fishing hook, and they, they can yank out all the antibodies that bind to it. Uh, we can then characterize them, determine where they bind, how potent they are, whether which ones block infection. And then the very best ones can actually be scaled up and produced and then injected into people. It can be really helpful, for example, for sending um, healthy healthcare workers into a region that has uh, a large outbreak. You could load them up with antibodies beforehand and protect them for 30 or 60 days. Um, they could also potentially be given to people who, who are infected and, and that could maybe blunt the severity of the disease. And so that's a big effort. Tons of groups around the world trying to isolate antibodies, and we're working with several of them um, using our, our stabilized spikes as a, as a probe. Now, is that a shorter timeline than a vaccine? 
you'd still have to test it. That, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, so it would probably be a bit longer. Uh, the vaccine around the same time that we did, were determining the structure of our spike, our colleagues started making the the vaccine and, and testing it. So these antibodies still first have to be isolated, then scaled up, then go into phase one and, and other things. Yeah. Let's talk about, we have a series of questions on just how it's transmitted and you know, spread, how long it lasts. What is the course of the virus as far as how long does it last? You said you were referring to the World Health Organization. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This. Yeah, there's a ton of information on the WHO website that I encourage people to, to look at. Uh, I think after contracting the virus, breathing in the virus in, in some way, um, symptoms can start to show up within five days. Uh, possibly longer, but that's, it seems five days is around the sign that the, the first symptoms show up. Um, and then it just depends on the severity of disease as to how long it lasts. Uh, young people, children and young adults seem to have a fairly mild um, disease where it can be uh, much worse in elderly people, people with various comorbidities um, who have maybe some issues with their lungs already. Mm -hmm. And so that can last quite long depending on hospitalization and other things. It looks like uh, about 80% uh, of people who are infected resolve the infection without seeking, without needing medical attention, mm -hmm. whereas about 20% need uh, to be hospitalized. Mm -hmm. um, now, when you're not symptomatic, are you contagious? Yeah, that's what it, it looks like. It looks like during the, the first few days or even if you have a mild case that you are still able to, to spread the infection. But you have to show symptoms, I mean, before you're tested right now, it seems? It, it seems like a, due to a somewhat shortage of kits uh, in, in testing facilities, although that's regional. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think some countries have been proactive and have just started testing large groups of people. But here it seems more uh, once you start to show symptoms, then maybe you're encouraged to, to go get tested. Okay. Now, can coronavirus be spread through the air? You alluded yes, to that. Yes, absolutely. That's probably its major way of, of, of being transmitted. Um, through um, like attaching to various droplets and things as, as, as we exhale, as we cough, as we sneeze. That's what for some of these, um, this new term to me, social distancing yes. that we talked about and yeah. not having a crowded audience and other things, trying right. to stay at least three feet away. Um, so that way if somebody does cough, you know, hopefully the particles hit the ground bef before they land on, on people. Um, so that, that's where a lot of the, the idea of, of trying to spread people out, not pack people into high density areas. So through the air, the other way then is um, people who cough either like onto their hand and then touch a surface or cough directly onto the surface. Somebody else comes along, touches the surface and then rubs their mouth like I'm doing or touches their nose or their eye. That's another way of, of spreading it. But it's, it's gonna be through the air initially. Uh, from Joby, uh, a, a viewer asked, how long does the virus live on surfaces? I mean, everything from food to cardboard and packages maybe from some of these affected countries. Yeah. that's. A lot of those studies are ongoing. Uh, the WHO website had some information on that. It looks like it ranges between a couple of hours to a couple of days, but it's very dependent on the type of surface, the wood versus plastic versus uh, steel, uh, the relative humidity, the temperature in that region. Um, some of the information is uh, derived from what we know based on other coronaviruses, but probably safe to assume at least a couple of hours and possibly longer. Uh, there doesn't seem to be um, any need to worry about packages that have been shipped for days in the air and other things like that. Michael Jewell asked, does an increase in the ambient temperature, such as the gradual blossoming of the uh, Texas summer, decrease the ability of the virus to spread? Yeah, so the, that question's come up a lot as we're, you know, especially here as we start to emerge from winter. Mm -hmm. We don't know yet. Um, you know, we can kind of model it a little bit based on other coronaviruses, uh, but for this particular coronavirus, we, we aren't going to know. Mm -hmm. So until it, until it happens, the follow-up question on you know when the temperature dips again, if we see it improve when the temperature rises, yeah, kind yeah. Of wait and see. Yeah, in the case of the the nineteen eighteen uh, flu, it was it was it was strong throughout spring, kind of disappeared in the summer, and then came back hard again in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, since it's a, a global pandemic now, there is you know, there's regions of the world where the virus is not going to go away due to high temperatures, if it even goes away due to high temperatures. Um, anything people can do, this is a question we received, to boost their immune system to reduce the chance of infection, particularly those who are older and yeah. more, you know, susceptible to this? Yep. Uh, I just think general strategies for, for staying healthy, uh, sleeping well, eating well, maybe multivitamin, um, 
you know, what, or, or things that at least make you feel better or are comforting to you, but um, just whatever is generally done to maintain a healthy immune system. There is a lot of information out there, not all credible, and some of the ones that sound really kind of off yeah. likely are. Well, I can't say. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of different types of medicine, traditional medicines, uh, Western medicines, homeopathic remedies. It, you know, obviously, nothing has been tested for this particular coronavirus, so these, these things haven't gone through phase one and phase two and phase three testing, so we can't say definitively whether any of them help. As long as they don't hurt or they make somebody feel better, it's probably, probably fine. Okay. Um, preparedness, we've all been told to wash our hands properly, but can you talk about the effectiveness of hand sanitizer, other chemicals, yeah. uh, such as bleach or rubbing alcohol and yeah. killing the virus? Yeah, hand, hand, hand sanitizers contain an alcohol, I think usually around 70% or higher, uh, in some sort of gel form. Uh, that, those, those are really good. So alcohol actually break down the envelope of the virus and, and cause the virus to, to fall apart, and so that, that reduces the infectivity. Same thing with um, soaps, detergents. Detergents interfere with the proteins as well as the, the envelope that surrounds the virus. So those are all things that inactivate the virus. Bleach will mm -hmm. also be good for surfaces as well. Okay. Um, another question from Karen Holloway. Will the future be filled with airborne virus plagues? If that's even a correct oh, terminology. Oh, no. There's, there's already tons of viruses in the air um, already. So you know, maybe we're adding one more. Uh, but there's already, you know, rhinoviruses, coronaviruses, that, that sort of influenza viruses, many types of viruses that are, that are in the air and, and cause disease. Uh, you know, the main thing is, uh, another thing would be that, you know, viruses are unaffected by antibiotics. Like antibiotics work specifically on bacteria, have no effect on viruses. So taking ampicillin or something is not going to help with coronavirus or, or any virus. Um, talk about children. We haven't really seen this kind of in children or at least be severe, um, but they can still be carriers, right? Absolutely, yeah. Children uh, can be infected, have been infected. I think a, a, an encouraging sign is that they seem to have a very mild disease. Why that is, is uh, something under investigation and you know, curious to know. Uh, but the children actually seem uh, quite robust, young adults as well. Uh, I think there's only one person under the age of 20 that's died. Um, so it's, it's been particularly bad for people 80 and older, 70 and older. Uh, that's where we're seeing uh, most of the, the deaths. Especially those with lung issues or, or breathing. Exactly. A lot of them have additional comorbidities, um, smoking, uh, other issues. Um, we're going through them pretty fast. Yeah, we are. Good. We're getting them. We're getting quite a few in, though, so I'm trying to kind of parse them out and see. Um, what do people need to be doing to be prepared for an outbreak? Outbreak is a technical term, though, is, is it not? Or Yeah, I don't know. Like the, the term pandemic, pandemic, for instance, which was just announced yesterday, there, right. there's not actually a great definition for, for it. And, okay. Um, so now it's a pandemic. That's necessarily, doesn't change that, anything that doesn't you're really doing? change anything. It's okay. now a pandemic. Um, yeah, I think just general things to. To be, I, mean, I know uh, we're not doing anything. We're not. My family's not stocking up on toilet paper or, or, or anything like that. Yeah. Um, we have soap, so so we're good. Is the toilet paper thing just a basic? I don't know. Apparently, that se basic? that seems to be the the one thing we're most afraid <laughs> of, like running. I mean, yeah. Well, the alternative of not having toilet paper is not right. ideal. Yeah. Um, so, so I can understand that to some extent. Um, you know, I, I think one of the thing with like masks that people do a lot of questions about masks, whether you should wear them. Mm -hmm. Unless you're infected or caring for somebody who's infected, you should not have a mask. Mm -hmm. All right, so if you are infected, it, it does help to, to have it because, again, it's transmitted by breathing out, by exhaling, um, by sneezing and coughing. So if you are infected, wearing a mask can be helpful. Or if you're caring for somebody who's infected, wearing a mask can be helpful. And that means healthcare workers at hospitals caring for people need masks. Mm -hmm. um, and so going out and buying masks leads to shortages for people who actually need them who are caring for people. It'll be a really disastrous if uh, the hospitals become crowded with people that, that have COVID-19, then the healthcare workers, the nurses and others, doctors who are caring for these people get infected, then they have to stay home. Right. So make sure these people have the masks and have the personal protective equipment. Yeah. Um, should Texans uh, with autoimmune diseases be concerned? Yeah, having a weakened immune system makes you more susceptible to, to all infections. And so uh, that would be something to be uh, certainly concerned about. Um, we've answered some of these that have come in as far as, can we expect this to be a, Wait, oh, go ahead. Sorry, is it, you say autoimmune? Autoimmune. I guess it, okay. Like a Crohn's was, disease or, you yeah. know, one of those. 
A weakened uh, immune system. Yeah, that's different than, yeah, that's a, so a weakened immune system, yes, if they were immunodeficient in some way, that would make them more susceptible. Uh, I guess an autoimmune, autoimmune is Autoimmune is something different. I mean, even yeah. like arthritis is autoimmune. Yeah, um, true. So I, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I would need I, to get more information on that. I'm, okay. not, I'm not sure if people with autoimmune disease are more susceptible to bacterial or viral infections. And it may, de if they I are, it, it may depends. also depend on the type of autoimmunity, for instance. But, right. Sorry, I heard more of a weakened immune system. Yeah, yeah, but that's a good call. Yeah, pardon me for the, the confusion there. Um, people with asthma worried, are they particularly vulnerable? I haven't seen any, I haven't seen any data on that yet. Okay. Um, we've talked about people older. Um, to what level should healthy adults interrupt daily activities? Going to the gym, grocery store, yeah, kind I, of common meeting places. I think it's, uh, it's a personal decision based in part on um, comfortableness with, with risk, right? Like you and I may have different levels of risk taking. I might want to jump out of a plane and you don't, right? And, and so I think we have <laughs> facts. We know uh, that... I think now the risk of actually acquiring the infection is relatively low unless you know people who've been infected or in certain clusters or, or who have traveled. Um, and then if, if you're younger, then maybe you have a more tolerance for risk than if you're 80 years old and a mm -hmm. smoker. And so, so I think it, it kind of depends. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not personally altering uh, my lifestyle in any way. Um, the University of Texas is somewhat, so they've extended spring break by an extra week. I think we're going to be moving to online classes when we resume to try and just decrease the density of people in a, in a packed classroom. So that will have some uh, impact on me. But I think it's just risk tolerance. My, my parents are coming to visit next week. They're in their 60s. They ask me, is it safe? There's no way to say is it safe, right? There's, there's some probability they will get an infection, some probability they could die from that infection. Uh, and then it's just what level of risk are they comfortable with? Yeah, that was They're big, still coming, so. Yeah, that's a big question we had. You know, readers want to know if it's safe to travel to Texas or, or travel in general, be on an airplane yeah. with people who, you know, you don't know where they're coming from or whatnot. Yeah, I think uh, I would say that increases your risk of, of catching the, the virus. Mm -hmm. To what extent, I don't know. It's, it probably depends on exactly the travel, who you're interacting with. Um, let's see. That talked about the children. Um, let's see. You've been at this for years. Once this, this surfaced and we started seeing it kind of the map get covered with people around the country being infected. I mean, what is your perspective on this as far as COVID-19 and, and the fear we're seeing related to it? Uh, what's my reaction to it? Oh, so far, it all seems pretty reasonable. I mean, certainly people breaking into hospitals and stealing masks. That's terrible. Uh, I think people have a right to be concerned. The NBA just canceled their season um, it, yesterday. I think we don't know what it's going to look like, where it's going to peak. Uh, people are trying to take measures. One idea people are talking about is this idea of um, flattening the curve, right? So if we were to plot the number of people infected as a function uh, per day or something, we're on some sort of like upward trajectory. Even if the same number of people were infected overall, but we could sort of decrease that curve and spread it out over a longer period of time, that decreases the number of people per day going to the hospital. It allows our healthcare system to cope with it. And so that's what we're seeing a lot of these, these measures. Um, canceling the MBA, canceling uh, uh, meeting and classes, other things like that. If that just helps to, 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 to um, decrease the curve, spread the infections out, even if, we, even if everybody still becomes infected, but if we just spread it out over a longer period of time, it, it sort of decreases that um, initial rush to the hospital. Uh, and, and so that's what a lot of these measures are Strain on to the do. system. Exactly, strain on the system. So yeah. if we can just smooth it out and decrease the number of infections per day, even if it goes over a longer period of time, that's better for our healthcare system to handle it. Um, there have been some talk about, uh, I guess, what's the science behind uh, opinion on getting the pneumonia vaccine or other vaccines to help I guess, boost our immune system against yeah. this. Uh, I don't think there's any data that's probably not going to help. No? Yeah. Okay. Well, pneumonia, of course, attacks the lungs, and so I think the, the yeah. rationale there pneumonia is... Pneumonia is not a pathogen. Okay. Pneumonia is a disease caused by other pathogens. So, okay. like, flu can cause pneumonia. RSV can cause pneumonia. Bronchitis. Um, things yeah, like that. So that, right. So that's a disease caused by something. So there is okay. actually no, like, pneumonia vaccine. Um, okay. You have to get, like, the flu vaccine. And I don't think getting the flu vaccine is going to help prevent you from getting the SARS coronavirus too. 
There is an ammonia vaccine, though. I think I've received it some years back, and some people over 60 get it. But It'll be for a specific pathogen. Okay, okay. Um, so not, not a help right now, or not yeah, a yeah. Don't rush out to get your pneumonia vaccine yeah, in combat yeah. for this. Um, Anna Smith asks us, another doctor in the news last night mentioned that the plasma people that have been infected and successfully recovered can be used. Is that the antibodies that we're yeah, talking exactly. about? Yeah, exactly. So, so that is sort of the, one of the, it was more of an earlier method, still useful today though. Um, and the idea is that the, the infected people have produced those antibodies. Um, they're, they're flowing through the blood in the sera, and so you can spin down all the blood cells, harvest the sera, and then inject them into somebody else. Um, so that's something that can be done relatively quickly. It's just, um, it's a little bit harder because you have to get a lot of people to get a lot of blood and different people have different titers. Um, and so the, the sort of like the more advanced method is to actually try and isolate the individual antibodies and identify the best one and then make huge quantities of, of the best one. So then you can uh, uh, quantify it to make sure you're giving the right dose to everybody. But yeah, the, the sera can work. It's been used for Ebola virus and other things. And mm -hmm. it, I think it's shown um, effectiveness. I saw a question in our feed earlier, uh, kind of parsing through, and somebody was saying, because we're all being, uh, it's emphasized to practice good hygiene, wash your hands well, yeah. are we seeing the reduction of flu cases or anything like that as a result? I haven't seen any data on that, but yeah, there, there should be some sort of uh, effect on acquisition of other viruses that people catch around this time, uh, flu, respiratory syncytial virus, um, of some others, and so, it is, it is somewhat alarming that many people are finding out for the first time it's good to wash your hands and, and that prevents spread of disease, but it's okay. As long as people are finding out and using hand sanitizer, or, you know, just soap is, is perfectly fine. Okay. It should help reduce uh, other infections. Right, overall? Overall. Once infected, how best can a member of the public treat themselves at home and at what point should professional medical assistance be needed? You're hearing a lot of people, including some lawmakers, self-quarantining, just in the, the possibility that they get it, but if they show symptoms, you know, what's kind of a, a good course of action that you've seen? Yeah, I mean, part of it might depend on your employer and, and other things. I think uh, we're strongly encouraged uh, if we become infected to, to quarantine for at least 14 days. Right. Um, obviously, if symptoms become severe, you should seek medical attention. Mm -hmm. um, again, it seems about 20% of people need hospitalization, whereas 80% have been able to fight it without. Um, so I think it's an individual case-by-case -case basis. But um, yeah, isolation, uh, can is, is effective and so if you are infected try and isolate yourself from others but obviously it's difficult if you have a family and other things mm -hmm. so. now anything we're kind of the last it seems maybe not the dead last but uh you know in the world to be seeing the start to to really kind of cover the country any other country that's done something right in, in kind of minimizing the risk of this that think, you followed? Yeah, it, it looks like maybe um, Hong Kong has, has done a particularly good job of, of flattening the curve. Um, so there, there's some graphs out now showing the, the rise in cases per day, and most countries are on the similar trajectory. Um, Hong Kong looks like it's been uh, flattened out. I think South Korea is flattening a little bit. So, so there are just, just with uh, rapid testing, testing lots of people to figure it out, and then with quarantine and isolation and other things, they have been able to sort of decrease that curve a little bit. Mm -hmm. But if we're not massive or doing widespread yeah. testing and, you know, people are unknowingly transmitting, then the end isn't any near in sight or? No, yeah, we don't know where we're at, right? So it's, it's, it's going to have a slope and then it's going to peak and come down and we have no idea where we're at on that curve. Like, we're, we're still just going up. Well, Dr. McClellan, we appreciate all the questions you have answered. Uh, the half hour flew by. It yeah, it was fast. Um, but, you know, of course, we'll be keeping tabs on what you guys are working on there at the McClellan Lab at UT Austin. Uh, of course, you can keep tabs on the latest coronavirus news with the Texas Tribune by subscribing to our new newsletter. And that's uh, texastribune.org slash subscribe or T-R-I-B-I-T dot rather tribit, trib dot it at coronavirus. I botched that. So just do texastribune.org slash subscribe. Have a good one. Thanks for joining us.